Welcome everyone again. It's fantastic to be here at another annual meeting. Um, it makes me really proud um, and I think the team's really proud to have so many people from around the globe joining these meetings virtually, uh, connecting with us at various in-person regional events, um, and truly uh, working together as a global community. Um, data site success is in its collective efforts as a global community. Obviously, we build technology and we have services, but really we can't do what we do as data site in making sure that research is openly available and globally used without the global community. And so it's really important to just always, I think, acknowledge that. Um, and, and for me to also just thank you all for all of your contributions, both in, in being members, being contributors to DataSite, but also all of the work that you do within your ecosystem, within your um, partnerships that you have in different regions, all of the work that you provide to the different working groups, the steering groups, the, the regional expert groups. It really is truly remarkable what we can achieve as a global community. Uh, I'm really excited for the, the, for the next year ahead. And so you'll hear a lot about um, what different members and different community stakeholders are doing um, during the series of meetings today, as well as uh, work that we are doing as the data site staff. But really, that's driven by you as a community. And I think there's some really exciting opportunities for us ahead as a global community. So um, with that, I just wanted to say a final welcome. Thank you again. And I will hand back to Mohammed to introduce the session and some fantastic speakers that we're going to hear from in our first session today. Thank you so much, Matt, for the introduction. And yeah, welcome everyone to the first uh, session where we are going to share insights from the data site global uh, community. In this session, we have uh, two speakers as well. We have Yuyun Warwarti from Nyayangi Technological University, where she is going to share uh, the experience with connecting NTU data repository with data site infrastructure and how Nyayangi Technological University in Singapore is benefiting from connecting with data site services. We also have Sudeep uh, Bardahan from the ICIM Wudu uh, Mountain uh, Center in Nepal. That research organization is also part of the data site uh, community, and he is going to share an overview about that and how the organization is benefiting also from connecting with data site uh, infrastructure and services. But before we do that, I just want to start by sharing a quick overview about uh, data site and who we are. And in order to understand that, I would like to start with an introduction about open science and the persistent identifiers. And this will the main purpose also of the session to share an overview with uh, open science uh, practices, persistent identifiers, and a general introduction also to data site and our services. So uh, the UNESCO recommendation that was published on on the year 2021 on open science, they identified four main pillars for open science. We are talking about open scientific knowledge. We are talking about open science infrastructure. We are talking also about open engagement uh, engagement on social actors, and also talking about open dialogues with other uh, knowledge systems. In particular, we are going to talk about open science infrastructure pillar, or as it sometimes it will be called as open research infrastructure. So as the UNESCO also defines the open research infrastructure as shared research infrastructure that are needed to support open science and serve the needs of different communities. So these open research infrastructure are usually built by nonprofit organizations and they are uh, these nonprofit organizations are governed, uh, driven and sustained by their communities, the community of uh, members. And this is really, really important. Why? To ensure long-term long sustainability for these uh, organizations. The goal for open research infrastructure providers is to increase transparency and equity, and also to serve the needs of their uh, communities, which will bring more benefits to the research ecosystem in general. 
Uh, again, we can see on the document on open science infrastructure that was published by the UNESCO in the year 2022, they are highlighting uh, the important role or the critical role of integrating the resistant identifiers or bids as we call them in research workflows. We can see also in the first page of that uh, document from the UNESCO, they are talking about different types uh, of bids and they are citing data site uh, DOIs for research outputs. So I thought this is really important, uh, important introduction for you if you are joining uh, this session to gain an overview about data sites. It's really important to understand where we are coming from. So what is the term persistent identifier? So bid is a unique alphanumerical string that usually refers to a digital resource. That digital resource will always have a metadata representation or information about that uh, resource. We have different types of the resistant identifiers. We have the resistant identifiers that can be assigned for research organizations. And here we have the example of the research organization registry or ROR-ID. I included here, for example, uh, the ROR-ID for the Indian Institute of Technology uh, in Delhi. And we can see the ROR record for this research organization is featuring different metadata information from the other names that IIT Delhi can be uh, displayed or written in different languages as well in regional languages. We can see the organization type, we can see the location, we can see the website. And we can see also another example from the National University of uh, Malaysia, where we can see the ROR ID for this organization. We have also uh, the resistant identifiers that can be assigned for people such as academic researchers and contributors. And here we have the ORCID ID that can be assigned for researchers. And then we have uh, the resistant identifiers that can be assigned for object such as data sets, such as reports. And we will explain that uh, later in my presentation. I included here an example for a DOI that is being assigned for a data set. We can see uh, the DOI uh, is here, and we can see also uh, valuable metadata information about this research object. We can see the data set title. We can see the contributors who uh, generated or worked on producing this research data set. We can see their affiliations. We can see also their ORCID uh, IDs. So uh, we have here the DOIs, the digital object identifiers that can be assigned for all research outputs and resources. So I thought this uh, introduction about open science, the four pillars, open research infrastructure, within open research infrastructure, we have persistent identifiers, and we have these uh, different open research infrastructure uh, providers. So what about data site, who we are? We are a global community of research organizations. These research organizations come together and share a common interest, which is to ensure that all research outputs and the resources are openly available, and it's also connected with each other, all of these different research outputs. Why these research organizations want to achieve this goal? To help in advancing knowledge across and between the, uh, different uh, disciplines and subject areas, and also for us now and in the future. So as a community, we make research more effective. How we do that? By using the metadata information that we collect to connect research outputs and the resources. And at that site, when we talk about research outputs, we almost mean all research outputs from samples and images to data sets and the preprints. So we provide our members with digital object identifiers. And on top of that, we built also integrated services to help in improving research workflows and facilitating the discoverability and reusability of research outputs and the resources. And linking that also with the definition that we included about open research infrastructure providers as highlighted by the UNESCO, we are a non-profit organization registered in Hanover, Germany since the year 2009. So the data site global community consists of more than 1,400 research organizations. And to clarify also research organizations, 
organizations in our community, can be universities, can be research institutions, can be research centers, they can be uh, data centers, they can be learned societies, they can be governmental or international research organizations. We have more than 321 members and we serve organizations in more than 56 uh, countries around the globe. And so far we have uh, registered more than 66 million DOIs. So data site DOIs in general are suitable for a wide range of research outputs. I'm sure if you are a data site member and you are joining this, you are already aware that we can support registering uh, DOIs for a various research outputs such as research data sets, collections, associated workflows, software script that has been written while conducting a specific research process. We also support the images and the models. We also support the gray literature, such as electronic thesis and dissertation, conference proceeding, reports, technical standard, preprint, preprints, the initial version of the articles before sharing it with the publisher. Usually all the valuable research outputs that uh, research institutions are producing producing and are disseminating it through their institutional repositories. This is a screenshot from Data Site Fabrica. And as you can see, the 1400 research organizations that are part of the Data Site community are making a, a wide range of research outputs and the resources discoverable and visible through the Data Site infrastructure. So they are registering data sets, text files, images, samples, software script, reports, books, and book chapters. As you can see, a wide range of research outputs uh, and the resources are being more visible and more discoverable through the data site DOIs. So uh, again, a question about the value and the impact of uh, integrating my thesis and dissertation, my reports, my data sets with DOIs. For example, in particular, in the context of research data sets, integrating uh, digital object identifiers and connecting with data site infrastructure will make your research data aligned with the FAIR uh, principles. The FAIR principles were introduced in the year 2016 with the goal to maximize the reusability of uh, research data sets. So integrating your research data sets with uh, DOIs and other bits as well will help in making your research data sets more findable through the metadata that are assigned using that global identifier will help also in improving the accessibility through the retrieving metadata through the DOIs because DOIs you can always retrieve the metadata information that has been registered while uh, using the identifier and it will also increase uh, the possibility for your research data sets to work across uh, different uh, systems as well, increase the interoperability for your research data sets. And the end goal is always to maximize the reusability of research uh, data sets. So integrating your research data sets with uh, persistent identifiers is really, really uh, important. And in general, connecting your system, uh, your publication system, your uh, institutional repository, your, sp your specialized ETD repository with data site uh, DOIs will really help in improving visibility and discoverability. As we highlighted, it will enhance the accessibility also for your uh, outputs and it will make your research data sets in particular aligned with the FAIR principles, and you're also obtaining recognition for all your research outputs beyond the journal article. We all know the value of the journal article, but it's just like the final output of a long research process. There is a lot of valuable research outputs that researchers and the contributors are producing while conducting the research. There is the data sets, the uh, reports, the samples and the images, all of these valuable research outputs should be discoverable, should be shared also, and should be connected with uh, DOIs. And we all know that increasing discoverability and visibility will lead to more citation, and you are also connecting your uh, 
all your research outputs, your uh, your publication system, your repository with the global ecosystem, which will bring more benefit to your uh, overall institution. Mm -hmm. And you are also being aligned with the open research practices and supporting the trust in the research infrastructure, as we highlighted earlier in the uh, UNESCO definition. So as we also mentioned in the UNESCO definition regarding open research infrastructure, these uh, we are sustained through our community, our community of members that we are welcoming them uh, today within the data site community meeting 2024. So how you can join if you are joining us uh, today and you are not a data site member, we have two options if you want to join the data site community. We have a direct member uh, option, and this can be uh, obtained by your university or your research organization. And in this case, when you obtain a direct membership, you can connect uh, your specialized repository. Let's say you have a specialized data repository, and you have also a general publication system. You can connect both uh, repositories with data site infrastructure and start to start also registering DOIs for your research outputs. Then we have a second option, the consortium option. This is a more sustainable option. So if you are listening to us uh, today and you are like a national center in your country or you are part of the ministry of your higher education in your country and we are, even if you are like a leading institution in your uh, country and you wish to take the initiative and start uh, a data site uh, consortium. So the consortium option is a more sustainable and cost effective option and it comes together when a group of universities or research organization that are sharing the same goal, the same vision, they are within one country or one region, they will come together and they will start a data site consortium and then we will have a consortium lead and then each organization will join as a consortium organization. And then each consortium organization will get the chance to connect their uh, systems, their repositories with data site infrastructure and start to register a data site DOIs. It's really important to mention that within the data site community, we have 60 consortium leads worldwide. So they are leading data site consortia in their uh, countries, providing their uh, research organization in their countries or their regions with data site uh, DOIs. We have uh, consortia in countries like Brazil, United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, Australia, Nigeria, and uh, more. I included here a few examples. We have, for example, the uh, United Kingdom data site consortium, where we can see we have uh, around 111 consortium organization joining this consortium. They are connecting more than 165 repositories with data site infrastructure. We have the German National Li Library of Science and Technology is also leading a data site DUI consortium uh, in Germany and providing data site DUIs to more than 163 uh, research organizations uh, in Germany. We have also a consortium uh, in France. We have also Japan Link Center is leading a data site DOI consortium in Japan. So if you are listening to us, joining us today, and you want to explore that idea of uh, joining the data site community, starting uh, a consortium or joining as a direct member, feel free to reach out uh, to us. We also have a, a fantastic funding opportunity that I wanted to share very quickly with you. We have the data site global access fund. We launched the first uh, round in 2023, uh, the global access fund with the aim to provide uh, financial support because we really understand that in some communities, there are some financial barriers that are preventing them from using and integrating resistant identifiers in their services. So we wanted to, to provide some support to these uh, communities. As I mentioned, in 2023, we launched the first uh, round. We received more than 185 applications, and we ended up awarding 12 organizations in the countries that you can see from Lebanon to uh, Georgia to Brazil to Indonesia uh, as well. 
applications are open for all non-profit organization in Africa, Middle East, and uh, Asia. So we are repeating the same uh, thing again. We are launching the second round for the Global Access Fund. This year, we are funding two tracks. The first track is outreach and engagement activity. So if you are a university, if you are a national center and joining us today and you want to organize outreach and engagement activities in, in the form of capacity building, about data site uh, DOIs, about open research practices and you really want to raise the awareness among your community by organizing events webinars workshops or even preparing educational uh, resources in your own language feel free to uh, submit an application within this track. We also have uh, infrastructure development track. So if you don't have any repository at your institution, or you even have a repository, but you want to improve it, you want to enhance your existing uh, repository, you can apply also for the infrastructure uh, track, and you can find all the details about the data site Global Access uh, Fund here at this URL, just to share with you very quickly the timeline we launched the call for proposals on 2nd of September. The application due date is 11th of October. So we still have uh, time and we are expecting to announce the awardees in December 2024. And all of these projects will run through the course of 2020. Uh, five. Yeah, very quickly, this is an open invitation for you if you are not part of the data site community to join our global community of research organizations. As you can see on the screen, these research organizations are making a wide range of research outputs and the resources that they are producing open and connected. We support different also types of uh, repository, institutional, disciplinary, multidisciplinary. We also work with different systems from DSpace to Open Journal System to Invenue, and we also support different repository uh, sizes. So we can work with a small or medium or large repositories as well. Yeah, so this is very quickly the end of uh, my uh, presentation. And now I will hand over to uh, Yuyun Ishak from Nyang Technological University, who's going to share uh, their integration story with data site infrastructure. Thank you, Mohammed. Let me try to share my screen. Okay, I think it's working. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so good morning or afternoon or even yeah, evening for some of you. Uh, very happy to be invited for this data site community meeting. So for today, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of sharing about, uh, again, Mohammed has already mentioned DOI's value and impact, but it's going to be customized to our case, which is the Research Data Repository of Nanyang Technological University. My name is Yu Yun. I'm a librarian with Nanyang Technological University Library. So without further ado, let's start. I will introduce uh, my university very briefly. We were established back in 1991, so about 35 years old now. The strength is mostly on engineering, science, business, and humanities. We've got about 35,000 students all together. And there are close to 8,000 faculty, research staff, as well as administration staff. And it is a research intensive university. And because it's a research intensive university, it kind of makes sense. When in 2016, the university uh, drafted out a research data policy. The policy actually stipulates research data should be managed and shared in a timely and responsible manner. So if you work in an academic institution, it's quite common to start um, having all this policy and guidelines. It seems a little bit top down, but I think from, from academic point of view, institution's point of view, it kind of makes sense because we want to move in a uh, unified direction. And because of this policy, we started building up a repository for research data. So we launched that repository for research data in 2017, and it's open for our community to actually share, deposit, and archive their research data. Now, uh, our repository, research data repository, is actually built using the open source software, Dataverse, and it's managed by the library. Currently, we have close to 2,000 published data sets with a total of approaching 60,000 files in total. Um, now, when, when we kind of like started this repository project, there are some best practices 
and uh, global practices that are already going around. What you see now on my screen is something that I have updated because uh, guidelines keep on changing, being updated. So what you've seen is probably the most updated one that I've put in here. The first one is from the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. They have a framework for good practices for repositories. So one of the point in the framework, if you're building or having a repositories, is about discoverability. So the repository ideally should assign persistent identifiers that point to the landing page of the resources. And if there is another uh, uh, best practices, the second one, I took an example from Cortrasil uh, body. They are a certification agency that's giving Cortrasil certification for repositories. They also have a requirement on discovery and identification. So it mentions that once discovered, digital object should ideally be referenceable through full citations, including persistent ID, to help ensure that they are accessible into the future. So all of these kind of best practices globally and internationally is something that we took uh, into consideration very seriously on the stage where we develop our repository. Um, okay, <laughs> what you see now is a slightly kind of old article taken from 2017 articles by Klum and Huber, but I think it's kind of like uh, give you a very good illustrations as the kind of persistent identifiers that we really want that kind of like can last quite a good deal of, of uh, length of, of the length of time into the future, right? So the article is actually talking about which systems are here to stay. And as you can see, this uh, graph here, giving up the illustrations that out of 1,300 repositories that they surveyed back in 2015, uh, more than one third of it is actually using uh, DOI, uh, uh, persistent identifiers, and majority of them are using DOI. So with that kind of like background, we decided that we are going to use persistent identifiers of DOI for our repositories. Um, the next graph that you're seeing here, I took it from the library carpentry fair data and software. It also illustrates our requirements that we want the persistent identifiers to be able to connect the research output. Connecting to other research outputs that's already there, there is the source of the data set that researchers built, and it's also kind of like linking to the publications, et cetera. So this uh, interconnectivity is something very important to us as well. Now, what you're seeing is the real case <laughs> from our researchers. So this is becoming more and more common. The researchers, the authors, when they are submitting their article to the publisher to be published, there are more publishers coming up with this requirement. Can you also share your data availability? Can you also let us know where do you actually park and share your research data that's underlying this particular paper? So this researcher actually happily wrote down all the way, author contributions, data availability, then he got stuck there. They saying like, okay, data that supports the funding of this study should be, should be available in our repositories, but then at what? So he actually left it blank and then came to the library and said, what do I need to do next? So this might sound quite uh, uh, familiar to you, especially if you're working very closely to help researchers with all these kind of things. And this is where um, there are teachable moments that this is also a good opportunity to explore, uh, to explain a little bit and let them explore a little bit about repository as well as the persistent identifiers. So I think most of you would have known that the data availability statement is typically used to describe where the underlying data for a research paper can be accessible, uh, typically with hyperlink, preferably a PID to the data. Um, so yes, we are seeing more and more such cases in which the article will come with a data availability statement and all the authors stating very clearly where they, are, they depart and they share their research data. Okay? So this is not only for transparency or research integrity and transparency about the, uh, the underlying data, but it's also serving 
the discoverability, the findability. If you have done a lot of work in cleaning up your data, putting your data in the repository, obviously you need them to be discovered. If you've made the effort to open up your data, then you want people to actually discover them. And this is this is where the persistent identifiers actually plays a very crucial part. Um, I think I mentioned just now, our repository is built using Dataverse. So Dataverse give a very clear outline um, to all the users, including us, the administrators, of how people can actually cite a data set, okay? So the portion of that citation, the component of it, includes the unique identification. So citing now is not only about putting the author, the year, or the title, but persistent identifier is definitely a must when you are citing, uh, data, uh, cite, citing the data set. I'm a librarian, so we are very, very into all these proper citations and all that. But no matter how, there's always a variations to author's name. Uh, this is one of the most common uh, problems. I think uh, back then, before the researcher ID and, and all these identifications are available, we struggle to kind of like grabbing all the information with using the various permutations of author's name. I think some of you, some of you might have uh, the same experience as what I've described, right? But with persistent identifiers, for my example, we're using DOI, then it should be quite easy to identify and quite easy to differentiate the research output, okay? And of course, for the researchers, their point of view, they would like to see an impact, yes? So we make them, uh, you know, publishers, funders, even librarians tell you, share your data, make your data open. If they do that, then the first question is, what's in it for them, right? What's the impact? And the impact that the authors would like to see is definitely the ultimate one would be the citations. So they want to see the number of views of people viewing my data set, are people downloading my data set? Are they reusing it and ended up citing me? That kind of thing. So with persistent identifiers, we really hope we can capture all these metrics and display it to the uh, authors, to the data depositors, that yes, uh, your data set that you're sharing and make open are actually being used and creating an impact, right? Um. I think one of the sessions today in community meeting will be by Irache, and she probably would share with you more about data citation corpus. I think it's, it's a project by data site in which to kind of like collect a more comprehensive picture of data set being cited. Uh, in other words, the data citation. I'm very excited and looking forward to this, the development of this project. And I hope I can hear more from them as well. Okay. And last but not least, I would just like to highlight the data site commons, which we often use as well to describe to our researchers about their impact. So for one uh, of the examples I'm using here is from our researchers, Michael. Michael is uh, working in the School of Humanities. So in here, I can see he got about 19 data sets that uh, stored in our repository. Data set, uh, data site commons can actually display all this because we are using data site to mean the DOI. So these are the number of citations that he has received, the number of views, as well as the number of downloads of all his uh, data set. So this is the kind of reporting that creates an impact. This is something that the researchers would like to see as well. Okay? So in a nutshell, I would just like to recap uh, my, my quick sharing. If you're having a repository or intending to build a repository, we might want to consider using the standard that is recommended or mandatory even. And of course, uh, one of the objective of open repository, such as uh, our repository, is to increase the visibility and discoverability of research data. So we have no intention for the data set to just collecting dust in the repository collecting digital dust maybe, but it is very, very important to make them discoverable. And by the end of the day, we would like to see an impact. 
in terms of data matrices and data citations. So I think that's all from me. Thank you so much. Back to you, Mustafa. Thank you so much, Yuen, for sharing this uh, interesting overview. And now we will hand over to uh, Sudeep uh, Bardahan, who is going to share their experience with connecting their RDS system with data site infrastructure. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to share our experience uh, of DataSite at ECMART, uh, and thanks DataSite for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Sudhi Pradhan, uh, and I am with uh, an organization called ECMART based in Kathmandu. Uh, so just to quickly give you uh, an introduction to my organization, uh, we are uh, like an intergovernmental governmental regional mountain learning knowledge center. We uh, work uh, in the region called Hindukus Himalaya, the green part, as you can see on the map, uh, which is very important from various perspectives. Like there are four global biodiversity hotspots in our region. Uh, we have a big water storage. Uh, we call it like third pole and many others. And then uh, there are like eight member countries from Afghanistan, uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, uh, China, India, Pakistan, Myanmar, and Nepal, uh, and there are 10 major river basins uh, in our region. Uh, so uh, I will be mainly talking about uh, a regional database system, the uh, data repository that we have, and again, how we use uh, data site uh, to strengthen our uh, data sharing. Uh, so it's a, actually, uh, we have a central data repository for different thematic areas in Hindus Himalaya. Uh, we have uh, various kinds of data sets, as you can see, like core GIS, remote sensing data, to various thematic like biodiversity, disaster, air quality, cryosphere, like glacier, glacial lake, kind of snow cover, climate, and socioeconomic and hydromet kind of data uh, at various geographical uh, and temporal scale uh, that we store in our data repository. If you go into technical details, like uh, like broadly speaking, we have three components, major ones, uh, like data that we store uh, in, the, in, form, in the form of different databases, uh, as well as network storage drives. And uh, another major important thing is the metadata describing the data for which we have been using from 2000 seven or so, like six or so, seven, and the Yafia Woods Geo Network, a uh, metadata management system. And to the outside, uh, like our audience, the public, we have a data portal called RDS portal, rds.acmod.org, uh, through which people can access, uh, find and access data. Uh, so if uh, a person goes to our data portal, rds.acmod.org, and they can search with the keyword, in this example, a land cover, and then once, you press uh, like search, then you will be seeing the uh, result like this with detailed list of data sets. And if you click a particular data, like you will get detailed metadata uh, like this one. And then the data set, which is publicly available, you will uh, see the download button uh, there, uh, clicking which uh, one can download the data. Uh, and also on top of data, we also develop uh, like information systems, data visualized applications on top of that uh, for various uh, thematic issues or reasons. Uh, these are some examples. There are many more. Uh, the key to this application is again, like we use different technologies in terms of like uh, mapping servers, uh, platforms, uh, SPC cluster computation, everything. So on top of which like uh, we develop uh, again, information services, like a uh, few glimpses, like you saw in the earlier slide. And the point I want to make is like, to all of these like based, like uh, depends on the major components, the data, like uh, which is stored in our regional database system repository. Uh, so we have a data policy in place. Like we actually established our regional database system back in 2014, uh, launched it uh, in 2014. And then we have a data policy which aligns with our, the philosophy of open and free access to scientific information knowledge. Uh, you already heard from uh, Mustafa, like uh, Mohammed Mustafa about fear. So we adhere to that principle. 
and our data are licensed under Creative Commons Attribution, so which means people can download it, use it, reshare it, or uh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and also we try to link our data with our partners. Uh, so this is uh, an example of uh, uh, like uh, we have linked last year, like with TPDC, uh, Third World Initiative at uh, China under Chinese Academic Science. So we like through like it's a metadata link, let's say like uh, we have uh, showcased or selected records, data records from there in our data portal, and they have done the same in their portal. So uh, it is uh, to promote more data sharing or findability of data uh, uh, because you cannot develop everything, anything uh, on your own. So the networking and then connecting portals is very crucial. And that's that's the reason, like example I'm giving you here with our partner. Also in the past, we also uh, linked our data portal, especially the metadata with GeoS Geo portal. So people going to geoportal.org can also source data uh, stored in our data portal, I mean, the, uh, repository. Also we uh, offer our data set, I mean, data repository to our partners, those who have who do not have uh, infrastructure to host and share data. So we have extended our uh, support to that. So this is an example of like, uh, like whether station data that uh, we have hosted in our repository for an organization called Ugin Wanchuk Institute in Bhutan. Uh, and also we have uh, record, I mean, uh, register our uh, data catalog with Google. So people going to data source the research that google.com, just like people going for uh, publications, they go to scholar.google.com. So similarly, they have a dedicated data uh, like searching uh, place where if people search, they readily find our data because we have also uh, registered our data catalog there as well. And having said that, uh, so in 2014 that we launched and then we started sharing our data. Uh, but again, the questions are uh, sometimes we get asked like how we can, like uh, people using our data, they asked us like how we can cite your data. And also we also would like people to like cite our data, of course. And that's why like we joined a data site uh, late in 2018, uh, I believe, uh, so that we can create or generate DOIs uh, so that we can share it with our data users. Uh, so the workflow, quick workflow is like, we, as you already saw the metadata, the geo network metadata management system that we use. So uh, we first create the metadata uh, and store in our metadata catalog. And then uh, once data is ready for publication, uh, then we create a DOI uh, in data side using Fabrica. Uh, and then that allows us to generate DUI and then which information, the information we again, uh, the very information for sharing that uh, citation information, we again put back in the metadata, update our metadata with that information so that when people download our data, they also get the metadata attached to it. So they see, uh, they like how to cite our data. Uh, in the past, like uh, when we had many data sets, we used Python scripts, uh, again, exploiting this data site REST API to automate data like a DOI generation. But these days, uh, there are uh, quite like not many data uh, DOI that we generate on a regular basis. So we use rather Fabrica. Uh, regarding the persistent identifier, we heard so much uh, in earlier presentations. Uh, so for our own uh, ease, like uh, we, we have 10.2. 260, 66 for our ECMO RDS, I think. And then we use RDS dot and then metadata ID, like the unique ID that we store in the metadata catalog. Uh, so for our own purpose. Uh, so uh, again, uh, using this like, uh, then this is just uh, an example, like the land cover data for anti Hindu Kush annual land cover data. So this is the metadata on the left. And on the right, uh, we created a metadata, I mean, uh, DOI for that particular data set. Uh, as you can see, see RDS.1972511. So that's the metadata ID we have in our system, in the metadata management system. So uh, 
So again, uh, as you can see, the DUI, the URL for that, and the citation, that citation information along with uh, DUI, we put back in the metadata, like I said earlier. Uh, this is a kind of thing like on the user limitation, we attach that information. So such so as the citation, and then you have that information. So that's how we, we work, uh, like we have incorporated uh, in our workflow. So uh, uh, at the beginning, we had uh, quite a few data set, I mean, device to generate, uh, but uh, lately we haven't had uh, uh, that many data set, but uh, in coming days, uh, we are hopeful that our researchers uh, who are working in different uh, areas, uh, the data sets they are producing or generating, they will be ready for publication. And so uh, definitely DOI's number will again pick up uh, in coming days. Uh, so this is a quick uh, snapshot of like how many, because there are around 370 that DOI's that we have generated for our public data sets so far. Uh, so to conclude, uh, again, uh, the first uh, thing I wanted to make, uh, uh, emphasize is like we, a joint data site mainly to uh, be like, enable ourselves to create DOI so that uh, people can cite our data. So it has perfectly like uh, helped us uh, in that respect. Uh, and uh, recently, as as the previous speaker was also alluding to, like uh, a few of our uh, colleagues, uh, they when they write papers and then they also need to uh, like. Uh, give the location of uh, the data. And for that, they need DOI for data. And again, they come to us uh, asking for help to create DOIs and which we do. And so so this has already also like uh, greatly helped them and helped the uh, most as an organizer. So thank you, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Sudeep, uh, for sharing this interesting overview. We literally have five minutes uh, left for the questions. And uh, yeah, feel free to post any question in the Q&A box. So the first one, is it possible to assign resistant identifiers for biological data sets or else any domain specific data sets? Yes, it's completely possible to uh, assign DUIs for a specific subject area uh, data sets, and not only data sets as we explained, but different research outputs and resources. And uh, there is a question about the challenges that you faced during the integration, and if you have any advice for new data site members or members that are considering joining a data site. If you can share your overview in one minute, uh, Yuyun first, if you're gonna start. Okay, for our case, our repository is actually fully integrated. So whenever somebody is creating a data set, that UI will be straight away minted directly. Uh, but we do have a second approach with what Sudip has already shared. We also do a manual one, which is using Fabrica for special cases in which they do not park the data set in our repository, but they still need the DOI for sharing purposes as well as citation purposes. So the Recommendation for new data site members, I think you need to kind of like um, think through really the, the selling out points to your stakeholders. And it's, it's not just merely, you know, uh, giving the persistent identifiers. I think we need to take it, everybody, the stakeholders to think one step ahead, what is the return of the investment? For our case, uh, the return of the investment, we want the data set to be viewable by public, you know, there is a number of views, number of downloads, and number of citations that prove all this and becomes the return yeah. of our investment. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Yuyun. And I think Sudeep also, you agree with Yuyun in, in that? Do you want true, to share? True. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, we uh, we have a, a slightly different workflow. Like we create uh, metadata, uh, like in our metadata management system, the catalog for all the data that we uh, have produced. But again, uh, our researchers they want to publish the data, uh, their uh, publish their papers before publishing the data. So we generate DUI only when uh, we make our data public. So there is no automated thing as such. Uh, but again, when we make the data available in our data portal, uh, like uh, publicly available, then at the time we we create the UI. So otherwise, yeah. uh, not no no challenge as such. Exactly. So yeah, and we, in the workflow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
So there was a question also around the data sets and the DOIs in particular for these uh, for you for your cases that you have just uh, presented. Just giving I'm um, slightly concerned about the time. I want to highlight also that we have published a uh, New Yang Technological University use case and also uh, ICI MOD uh, Sudeep Institution use case and the different use cases also about how different research organizations are using data site infrastructure. So these use cases are published in English, in French, in Arabic in some cases. So please uh, visit data site blog and you will have uh, an interview with the uh, repository manager and highlighting also the integration use cases, not only for uh, the, these two, uh, two institutions that we featured today, but also for other uh, institutions. So yeah, I highly recommend to go to the data, data site blog and explore these different uh, use cases. I think you will find them uh, really, really useful. And we have almost one minute left before we close uh, this session. At the end, I would like to highlight that we still have more sessions to come. This is just the beginning of the annual community meeting 2024. We have more and more interesting uh, sessions that will start in five minutes, as you can see. So please, you have this URL, go to the URL, check the session that you are interested in, and feel free to register immediately uh, for this session. At the end, I would like to thank everyone who joined us today, whether they are an existing data site member or they are considering to become a data site uh, member. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. And please, before you close the session, complete the three questions follow up uh, poll after the webinar, because this feedback, your feedback is really, really important for us to improve our future uh, events. Thank you so much to our uh, speakers that joined us today. And thank you to everyone who joining uh, us. Thank you and see you uh, in the next session. Thank you so much.